of these projects be able to, in a very informal way, share with you how we uh, change the way we do the procedure mechanical thrombectomy. The amount of resources that are being uh, uh, used to fight this, uh, the battle against stroke is just incredible. Acute stroke, as we all know, has a huge impact in morbidity and mortality of our population, but the one area that we still suffer is uh, the disability. We're able to affect the mortality and stroke, but uh, when it comes down to uh, stroke and the disability, it still represents the number one cause of problems in the United States, and certainly worldwide, it still has a huge impact. This timeline uh, kind of highlights a little bit of uh, the different, um, uh, uh, what was believed to be at that uh, time point, uh, the best way to go about these procedures. But you can imagine that uh, in our uh, world of neurointervention, there were different ways to approach this problem, and the evolution to get into a situation of having a uh, balloon guide proximally, an intermediate catheter, the stent retriever, uh, local aspiration, proximal aspiration, that seemed to be uh, really the final path when you look at the, all the different components of the techniques that were available before, of how do you kind of put all that together in an optimal way, that seemed to be the solution for us. I think the number one thing for us was control of distal microembolization. That is one thing that I didn't have. Uh, the other thing is I wanted to make sure that uh, even though I take a little bit of initial time to set up the system, I am able to more often have a first pass uh, recanalization. That actually in the end translates in time efficiency in the procedure. The issue of uh, that I was a, a struggle for a long time was access. And once the uh, inner catheter and the flow gate two were improved, that access issue was uh, out the window. I remember a discussion I had with Rene Chapeau in, uh, about this topic, and, uh, and Rene was extremely a huge advocate of balloon guides, and, and he brought up to me, you know, Dimitris, today I can do the access using even the inner catheter from the flow, from the flow gate too. You don't have to exchange, you don't have to do, uh, uh, you know, the more cumbersome approach, you can actually, whatever you open the pack, you're able to, to build that uh, system and you can take it up and you'll be able to get access in the majority of cases. And uh, I was like, well, I mean, that's not my experience. I was just not seeing that with the uh, uh, older generations of balloon guides in general. And uh, so that was very important to me. The other one is the issue that we could use uh, this platform for uh, delivery of many different types of uh, 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 tools that, that we may, that are required in mechanical thrombectomy. If you think about it, we don't know if we're gonna find a uh, intracranial stenosis, a proximal stenosis at the, at the level of the carotid artery, or it could be um, a large clot burden, it could be already a pre-fragmented clot. I mean, there's so many things that can uh, be part of a mechanical thrombectomy. So having a uh, platform that has uh, somewhat of a low profile that allows you to navigate, and so the navigability, low profile, but at the same time allows you to deliver uh, a large amount of uh, tools that uh, may be required for the different situations, well, that changed the game. It was clear to me that uh, my colleagues in Europe were uh, publishing with actually balloon guide technology that was uh, uh, probably uh, first or second generation. So they were doing, they're showing results, showing improved rates of recanalization, showing better uh, first time uh, recanalizations with the technology that they had in balloon guides. So there was a strong feeling that uh, balloon guides should be incorporated in mechanical thrombectomy. But even listen to those publications and uh, you know, show a few of uh, the work of Vitor Pereira and uh, the European group uh, put together uh, their initial experience with mechanical thrombectomy using balloon guides. Uh, was pretty obvious that uh, it seemed that uh, they were having amazing results, um, but uh, in the, likely the balloon guide was playing a significant role in that. But honestly, it was very difficult for me to see how much was really the balloon guide versus they're just great operators, everything else was uh, working well. Um, 
it took, uh, you know, not only having the evidence of better tiki to be in three and better uh, for, or faster pr uh, pro uh, procedures, but it, not only that, having better outcomes, all that had to be, I think, dissected in a way that um, was only possible when I saw the work done at the University of Massachusetts with the, the in vitro isolation of uh, the components of balloon guide, a stent retriever, aspiration, and then you can evaluate each one of them and see how much of an impact having a uh, balloon guide uh, with aspiration uh, and stent retriever together, they could have a tremendous uh, decrease on disembolization compared to any other technique. And I think that uh, that visual, then I translate that back into the clinical results that were seen that we couldn't really see exactly what part of the procedure was causing the effect. Um, that for me was a huge um, uh, selling point that uh, I needed to revisit my technique. I needed to really consider this. Um, the other thing that uh, I think was uh, very uh, impactful is to be able to, uh, for the first time, measure what is the flow reverse you get into the distal anatomy. And that is something that having the flow as you're removing the clot in the, from the ICA, you can have that the, uh, the measurement that the MCA is that you, the flow is reversed. You're not gonna have this embolization. It's just going against the, the, the flow to have any clot go in that direction. So obviously that is the best way to protect yourself is not only having the clot in your stent retriever, but also not allowing the incoming flow to disrupt the clot but beyond that, having the aspiration component reversing the flow and allowing to uh, retrieve any type of possible fragments that may be out there. Well, the flow model allows us to see um, exactly what uh, uh, we were trying to understand clinically and uh, this is so visual if you uh, follow the ability to have, when you inflate the balloon and you have a complete stasis of uh, all those particles. I mean, this is exactly what's happening in the circulation. But, uh, you know, pay attention how the flow is still continuous in the circle willis. So the ACA is getting integrated flow. Now the MCO obviously has a clot, so we're now going in the process of uh, engaging that clot uh, with uh, our intermediate catheter as well as uh, with uh, the stent retriever. And, but uh, notice that as you start aspirin, there's gonna be this vulnerable spot right there when the ICA is clear that you could have flow going into the MCA, but because you have the balloon guide on, you have a reversal of that flow. So you're not getting this embolization the moment that you open the clot, they remove the clot from the MCA. I mean, when we look at the comparison of using the uh, a guide catheter with aspiration only, but not a, a flow arrest and no balloon guide. So you're removing the clot, and look what's gonna happen now at the bifurcation. Um, at the moment that the clot clears the bifurcation, the flow goes into the MCA. So this is all distal embolization happening. The moment you drag the clot and you allow the circle willis to complete its uh, go from A1 into the MCA, you are taking pieces of clot into the um, MCA, in this case on the left side. But look at the comparison. When your balloon guide is on, you have the stasis, the column of uh, blood um, and the particles in this case that's not uh, moving, but uh, there's no concern. Even though there's anti-grade flow in the ACA, the moment you're bringing the clot, uh, the distant retriever around the ICA bifurcation, you will see that you don't have that same jump of particles into the MCA territory on the left side. The balloon prep is one thing that we also uh, used to fear or worry about. I think that you'll find that uh, if once you start doing that, we many times are able to uh, uh, really minimize any type of uh, potential perceived waste of time as your team is setting up things, the balloon prep is being done uh, simultaneously. So it's not like a, you stop the process to do that. It's almost like a, uh, it's part of a, a continuum and you have things done in parallel, uh, which really make that uh, um, extremely uh, easy and many times not really an, a big deal anymore. 
So I remember some cases that uh, we still have some limitations, uh, maybe because of uh, um, still access or maybe uh, cases that the blood vessels um, uh, will not allow you to have a balloon guide. I think we're still very vulnerable in those moments, but it, in the cases that you're able to bring a balloon guide, I think we should, uh, which is a majority of the procedures, we should definitely implement and incorporate that um, in our mechanical thrombectomy technique. It was extremely easy to adapt and try to create with a, uh, specifically Flowgate 2, an intermediate catheter and stent retriever combined to build this platform that today we think to be extremely successful in what we're doing.